Hello, everybody. Welcome to our page, Heritage for All. Uh, thanks for all of the attendees following uh, Heritage for All uh, page initiative page. Today we will start with the uh, first webinar, multidisciplinary heritage conservation approaches, theories, and application that belongs to our new program, Exchange Your Heritage. So we have the pleasure to invite the younger professionals and the master graduates applying for this program and get a convenient space sharing a good uh, heritage experiment or the dissertation for the global community, uh, which must be related to or considered under the sub themes of heritage conservation, heritage management, heritage economy, cultural tourism, and uh, museum studies. According to the collected applications, we announce the theme of every webinar on our page that will take uh, place only in English and broadcasted live on the Facebook page. Every webinar will have four applicants who will take around 20 minutes. Uh, classifying, classifying the application we received till now, we create this uh, statistic, statistic. So to create other webinars, please help us sharing our program announcement with your colleagues worldwide who will are into who are interesting and to fill in, in the application. Introducing our initiative, Heritage for All initiative it was founded in April 2017. It mainly focuses on the heritage and or museum management and conservation. It shares up-to-date aspects in relation to heritage conservation, site management, and museology with the young professionals within the virtual platform, as well as a group of capacity building activities. Interpreting our logos, the logo and the slogan, uh, these activities are often open to all interested people from uh, all educational backgrounds and from various age group categories as well. You can communicate with us with our initiative via these uh, link links or to the social media devices. Uh, uh, speaking about the, our last achievement in 2019, following ECOMAS and UNESCO World Heritage Center annual theme, Rural Landscape, we launched the second international online internship program, Rural Heritage and Traditional Food. Through our social media devices, you can review the great achievements of those international interns who were from India, USA, Italy, China, Turkey, and Bangladesh. They covered various perspectives of the rural heritage through the, their practical experience and literature reviews. Uh, also, we would like to acknowledge the professionals and the organizations that supported our interns with this uh, effective primary informative data and the knowledge. Uh, in 2021, we are looking forward to launch our third international online internship program, visualization of cultural identity. As we uh, shared uh, with yours along with the uh, last two weeks, uh, there are uh, four presenters from various backgrounds and the geographical zones who will share uh, with us uh, their knowledge. Now we will start with the first lecturer, Ms. Army. We are welcome Ms. Army from Philippines and uh, she will now start to share uh, her presentation uh, with us. Yeah, please, you can open your mic, please, Ms. Armin. Hello, good, good day, everyone. So I'm here to present the architectural documentation of Aguas Potables. It is a 97 years old, was, as of the moment, it is a 97 years old old water tank in Malolos, Bulacan. So, Aguas Potables means potable water. At that time, it was a source of uh, potable water of Malolos, Bulacan. So, um, 
historical structure are a representation of innumerable achievements of our ancestors. Uh, Ms. Arne, your sound is not clear. Please uh, make microphone near to your mouse, usually, please. Hello? Is my audio visible? Yeah, yeah, now it's clear, yes. Yes? Okay. Um, historical structure are a representation of innumerable achievement of our ancestors. This structure are defined the identity and growth of the community by providing intangible and intangible link with the past. So before I get into the brief history of the Aguas Potables, I want to share the history, why it is existing. Uh, why is there uh, water tank? in the Philippines. So after the independence in 1896 from the three centuries of Spanish rule, the five decades of American rule began from 1901 to 1945. Its subsequent contemporary period from 1947 to 1993. Despite of its short era in the Philippines, it has a great impact in Philippine architectural history by bringing in extensive array of forms and styles. As the American focused in education and free enterprise, it reflected on the new building that emerged, such as government centers, parks, schools, and commercial office buildings. So health also became part of the uh, civilization project to prefer Filipino Filipinos for self-rule because of the first civil governor of the Philippines, William Howard Taft. Um, Filipinos became obsessed to hygiene and practicality, thus waterwork system was built. One of the main example of this is waterwork system is the water water tanks made out of concrete. So before um, before the American period. Um, there is a cholera outbreak in Spa during that time there were no um, specific um, hygiene uh, sanitary during the Spanish era so during the American period uh, they focuses on hygiene and education so let's talk about the history of Agos Potables so it is built on the 1920s it is also named Mariano S. Tenko Waterworks. Um, the Aguas provide Aguas Potables provide water through many de decades, and Aguas Potables is part of the historic town center of Malolos City, declared by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, a uh, resolution two series of two thousand and one. So, the reason why it is documented is because it needs to be restored. So why restore it? Uh, because it is part of the cultural property and part of the identity of Malolos Bulacan. And of course, to promote preservation and conservation, and it can be source of knowledge. So the Agus Potables can be uh, converted into a museum. So the statement of the problem is that what are the status of the water cistern tanks built during the uh, American period in the Philippines and, and what is the possibility to restore and retain the Agos Potables to provide modern needs of the Malala city and what is the significance of the restoration. So the restoration, according to the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, there are two types of uh, restoration techniques. One is dynamic restoration and static restoration. So restoration can be adapted to, to the water tank in Malolos, Bulacan. Um, in dynamic restoration, it uh, adaptive reuse can can be adapted, uh, can be used. So it is often the only way the, the historic and aesthetic values can be saved economically. Uh, 
um, in static restoration, uh, restructuring and strengthening can be applied and combining new and new and old materials, substituting modern structures, and repair and replacement. So in the Philippines, there are water tanks that are uh, that are used in different uh, that are applying adaptive reuse. Number one is the uh, water tank in Cagayan or Cagayan Oro, Philippines. It was constructed in 1921 when the uh, water source of Cagayan de Oro was still coming from uh, Malsag. In late 1950, uh, the National Water Works and Sewage Authority took over the water system and stopped using the water tower. Thus, the cylindrical building was abandoned until then, Mayor Constantino Hauralia came up with the idea of renovating the tank and making it a city's museum in 2008. And then the next one is the uh, Panublion in uh, uh, Rojas City, Capiz. So Panib Panublion is a Hilagaynon term for her heritage. Hilagaynon is another language here in the Philippines. So it was constructed in 1910. Um, so it was constructed in 1910 during the term of the third president of the Capis, Pastor Alcazar. The 11.5 meters in diameter and 6.10 meters in height tank was uh, spared during the World War II. In 1993, the offices were demolished and for the first in the three decades, the water tank was seen. The old water tank looked quite imposing, strong, yet gracious. So according to the uh, Rojas City, to demolish this water tank, uh, it would be like cutting an umbilical, umbilical cord to the past. So, However, the water tank has outlived its usefulness as Rojas City had a new waterworks. So that's why they decided to convert it into a museum. Uh, the next one is a twin water, water tank in Cubao, uh, in the Barangay Socorro, Cubao. So it was built in the 1930s and one of the most historical structure in the city as it withstood earthquake and bombing. This water tank is as tall as 12 to 15 story building and it is now used as uh, bar it is now used by the barangay as the location of three offices including the barangay emergency health care and gender and development office so this adaptive reuse can be uh, applied to the water tank in malolos bulacan so So this can be done uh, to the water water system. So the scope could be um, after documentation of the water tank, um, the principle of restoration of um, by the 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 reason why it needs to be document doc, document documented is because. Um, it is a preparation for res possible restoration of the building and it could benefit the community. And when it is possibly can be restored, um, of course, the need of structural um, study is needed and the significant. So this is the site inspection. Uh, as you can see, there is a, uh, a slight tilt. Uh, the, the height of the water tank is 
approximately 23 meters and the diameter is approximately 10 diameters. So according to the uh, survey report based on rocket survey and engineering services, so the maximum horizontal of the tilt is 0.46 meters and its direction is to the north 20 degrees to the east. And these are the causes of deterioration. Of course, the direct exposure to noise pollution, uh, changes in soil, and exposure to high temperature. So uh, the water tank is not well maintained. So these are the my, my macro site data. Um, the, as you can see, uh, the, the physical profile is the location of the water tank, water tank of Malolos Bulacan is uh, currently situated. Malolos, Malolos is the capital city of Bulacan. This is the su major suburb man converted to Metro Manila. So the land, land zone land use and zoning is um, more on the, it is near to the commercial area and located to the population. Population is uh, a term to the center of the municipal, to the city center. And um, so this is the history of Malolos. Malolos is the cradle of democracy. So Malo the reason why we have a republic is because of the because of Malolos. So Malolos has a great contribution to Philippine history and ancestral home as government offices and re refugee of the reformists. Uh, churches plays important role in forming Repub uh, Philippine Republic, and so thus. These are the basic uh, information about Bulacan in general. So, and then um, the location of the water tank is in the center of the historic town of Malolos. It is adjacent to Malolos Cathedral and near to Baraswain. Uh, Baraswain is another uh, important historical landmark in Bulacan and it is located to Barangay Vicente. So these are the basic, uh, these are the view in, when these are the existing view of the uh, condition existing view and condition of the water tank so this one um this this map is uh done um way back 2015 um this documentation is my undergrad uh thesis before so this map is i got it i got it when i was um collecting information about uh, this water tank. So uh, as you can see, the view of the, or the, uh, or as you can see, uh, it is very, the water tank is the reason why the water tank is easily deteriorated is because of uh, its environment. So these are the microsite data. Um, I did an a short analysis of this. So I'll talk about the strength of the site. Uh, the strength of the site is it is the center of historical 
town center of Malolos, and the water tank is included in the historic, cent historic town center of Malolos, and it is adjacent to Malolos Cathedral, and it is surrounded by commercial establishment. Um, the witness will be, um, it is, the witness is, can also be the, surround, the surrounded commercial establishment because um, the, without proper buffer zone, it can damage the water tank um, because of the prone to pollution and the site is very small. And the threat would be the uh, horizontal deflection and the, the building is just right next to the road, which it can reduce the uh, security. Um, what are the opportunity? Um, the opportunity when, when the water tank will be restored, um, it will be unique when, um, if, if the water tank will be converted into a museum, it will be unique to the community thus it can um, it, it can be appealing to the people and it can provide new knowledge and it can introduce the unknown history about uh, Malolos City. And of course it is um, Man Malolos Cathedral is also a historical landmark of the city. So these are the uh, photo that I collected before. So as you can see, there is a uh, Mariano S. Tenko is the mayor before. Uh, he is the one who um, cons he is the one that that uh, construct the water tank. Um, when I when I conducted my research before, the what this water tank is in grave danger of being demolished because they thought that it is not it is not uh, contributing to the to the city anymore. But the uh, heritage advocates of the Malolos um, um, did did something about this dem demolition that uh, it is being stopped today. It it is still standing, but unfortunately, um, it is not yet. Uh, there is uh, there is not a that are so way back 2015 these are the structural system that can be the, that can be applied to the water water tank so that the strength of the water tank can be can be fixed. So the concept and principle of retrofitting. So they 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 suggest to apply a stiffener columns and inside steel frame to act as stiffening nodes. And then there's an epoxy injection and then counterweight to counteract the deflection. So according to the to the uh, re report, structural report, the soil is composed from interchanging layers of soft to firm, highly highly plastic clay silt sand. It is underlain by highly plastic silty clays that are stiff to that are stiff to very stiff and medium dense poorly graded sand. So uh, if the if the water tank will be restored 
and converted into a museum, these are the possible materials that can be used. So, um, I the the so for the door, uh, industri industri industrial style can be used, and uh, the steel railing and tangilia wood for thread. And for flooring, it can be wood. And for walls, it can be gypsum boards. So these are just my um, suggestions before. If, if the water tank will be converted into a museum. So the idea is uh, each floor has a different history of Malolos. So the idea is the ground floor will be the lobby and the second floor will second floor will be the his, uh, history about the water tank. And then the third and fourth floor can be a history about the uh, um, history about the cradle of democracy and uh, the remaining floor can be a uh, history about the Re Philippine Revolution. So these are the these are just the major events, and if of course if if um, if restore if it will be converted into a museum, it is important to study the behavioral pattern in a museum. So uh, I discovered that there are three types of visitors, frequent, frequent visitors, first timers, and organized group. And then also there will be an idea that um, uh, the, there will be also a local uh, study center. So this a water tank can also be a center for Malolos studies. So these are just a behavioral pattern. So that is the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you too much, Ms. Army, for your presentation. And uh, now we will give a floor for uh, Mr. Jovendam from India, and he can uh, complete the concept of water tank about, uh, from geographical uh, side. Uh, so we can share now uh, his screen, yes, to see his presentation. You are welcome, Ms. Jovendam, Mr. Jovendam, for you can get a floor to start your presentation. Please open your mic, Mr. Jovendam. Yes. Hi, hi, hi. I hope uh, uh, this can be seen clearly, correct? Yes, yes, we can see your okay. screen. Yes. So, good morning, good evening, and uh, <laughs> right, uh, good day to all uh, from uh, various parts of the world. So, uh, thank you to uh, the Heritage Fall Art team, uh, which uh, has provided me the opportunity to present this uh, uh, interesting uh, water system from medieval times of India. Uh, this is not much known to people um, uh, as such, uh, because no, uh, everyone is aware of uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, or uh, the Persian region, which is well known for current systems. But in India also, there are few Kanat systems and it's a contribution uh, that has come from uh, Persia itself. And so I'll be talking about some of these Kanat systems uh, uh, here today. And uh, since 2012, I have been uh, investigating these uh, systems um, uh, as part of my research work. Um, uh, as such. So the, these are existing in a particular region, which we call the Deccan Plateau. And that is why I have named them as the Deccani Kanats. And they are uh, quite unique uh, uh, when, it com uh, when we compare it to uh, the Iranian systems as such. So uh, just to give an uh, idea of what a Kanat is, 
uh, it's nothing but a subterranean project that is a, a tunnel is constructed right below the surface and this tunnel um, uh, intersects or cuts across the uh, water table allowing water to seep into this tunnel and uh, uh, then it flows out uh, through the kanat mouth right so uh, the, normally these uh, mother wells or um, the uh, area where from where the water is brought is either in a hilly area just like for uh, example in iran one will find it is the slopes of the mountain uh, along the elbrus mountains from where it is uh, uh, there is a lot of snowfall and lot of snow melting waters so that enters into the system that is brought in um, or that seeps into these tunnels and it is brought down to villages far away some of them may be 80 90 100 kilometers away uh, from the uh, um, uh, mountain systems as such so it is bringing water to dry arid regions as such so if you look into a, a map of iran especially yazd or um, any of those areas you will find so many holes in um, uh, sequence right uh, looking from a satellite imagery so uh, this is the the uh, bottom portion the uh, uh, image that you are seeing is the way it looks like from above right so uh, you'll find so many holes as if uh, someone had dug up the earth so these are nothing but the air shafts that you see uh, uh, on these tunnels so these air shafts allow uh, the uh, people to maintain these uh, systems so that the there is a flow continuous flow of water that happens through these tunnel the uh, this tunnel system uh, the tunnel is also called as the kanat gallery right through which the water flows right and there is a, a some, some of the kanats have a very clear exit and um, um, uh, which is normally termed as a kanat mouth right so this uh, technology uh, started off from the persian region um uh, long back maybe uh, sometime uh, in the uh, it has been recorded by polybius in somewhere around 200 bc so you can imagine so these systems were in existence long back as such and henry gabold uh, uh, does uh, mention about these systems were developed as uh, uh, part of uh, the copper mining so copper mines used to get flooded and they had uh, they needed a system to make sure that water is removed from these mines so they had dug tunnels um, uh, to remove this water and uh, some of the villagers thought of extending these tunnels to their villages so that is how the technology initially developed and today you will find um, uh, there are uh, uh, around 40 odd countries where you will find uh, uh, kanat uh, systems exist and uh, uh, and all these uh, started uh, uh, the diffusion of this started from uh, iran itself so you'll find uh, them in uh, uh, northern africa you'll find them even in spain where it is called galeria uh, you'll find in uh, find them in south america and north america probably it was the spaniards who took them uh, to these continents as well and towards the east the uh, probably the silk route uh, which became the uh, which also became the knowledge route and uh, uh, transfer route you can say so this brought these systems to the eastern parts be it iraq uh, afghanistan uh, be it pakistan especially baluchistan area we have so many of them right and towards uh, uh, china and india right in india uh, uh, it is uh, generally con uh, concentrated in the central part right uh, or southern part you can say the peninsular part as such right and these are known by different names across uh, the world you'll find them uh, find these names that are given on the slide right and in india you'll find these are known uh, in different names as well right within india so there are local designations that have been given by people so uh, you'll find them are called as surang bavi surang is nothing but a tunnel and bavi is a well so it means that wells that are connected with a tunnel so this is uh, the meaning of that so in uh, uh, maharashtra it is called a nehar that means a canal right which supplies water right and here uh, in uh, madhya pradesh it is called kundi bhandara so which means uh, a storage of uh, uh, what you call water uh, water storage structures that is what it means right in southern karnataka and northern kerala there are others also which are indigenous in nature but they are horizontal wells but do not have the length um, uh, or the air vent system when compared to the kares kares network or the kanat networks so here uh, these are household level uh, mini kares systems or kanat systems that we can say which are either called surangas or turanga 
right in um, uh, southern part of the country that is uh, kerala and karnataka state so the geographical distribution wise um, as i said the most of this uh, is uh, in the peninsular india and these are found in these six cities bidar which is uh, the uh, place where uh, first kanath systems were uh, uh, constructed bijapur hukkeri ahmednagar aurangabad and burhanpur and burhanpur is a very interesting location where you have a river uh, near about perennial river we can say right um, uh, during those days right and uh, uh, it is right on the banks of this river there is a city and they have constructed um, uh, kanath systems to bring in water right they were not using the water of the river in itself so that is an interesting part so this area which is called as dakan Uh, is um, nothing but a, a volcanic formation right um, uh, maybe some six, uh, 65 to 75 uh, to 120 billion years ago a million years ago the uh, volcanism related activities resulted in formation of uh, this area so now they are weathered so it does support some kind of uh, a little bit amount of uh, groundwater uh, storage as such along the uh, uh, areas where there are fractures it does store water and uh, interesting thing to be noted is that uh, uh, because of these western ghats or the mountains that run along the coast these regions fall under the leeward side of the um, uh, these mountains and result uh, into very less rainfall that uh, the, that these regions receive right less than uh, 100 cm of rainfall or some of the areas will re uh, receive um, even less than 60 cm annually and uh, these systems actually made it possible uh, uh, for uh, construction or uh, for uh, or development of new cities in these areas so uh, historically if when we when we look at the uh, the cities got developed uh, in deccan region mainly because of that and uh, the uh, this also showcases the uh, soil so one uh, unique thing uh, about the deccan plateau is that you have a portion where there is laterite formation as well and as i mentioned earlier these are um, highly drought prone areas um, uh, uh, arid areas as we call right and uh, summer season uh, we do uh, the temperature does go beyond 40 and uh, most of the surface water body is dry and result into uh, drought like conditions so coming to the history part of it so uh, as i said earlier so this region uh, during the medieval times uh, that is uh, somewhere between um, uh, the 1300s and 1800s this was uh, uh, purely under um, a few muslim dynasties so initially um, uh, they were the uh, uh, they, they were ruling from gulbarga and bidar so uh, this was entirely one uh, dynasty which was called bahmanis right later on the bahmani split into five different kingdoms uh, called the um, uh, that is bidar was one among them then the bijapur golconda ahmednagar and bera so all these six cities are distributed into these uh, five different uh, dynasties which broke away uh, from the original dynasty the uh, bahmani uh, bahmani sultans right so this entire this activity or this uh, period between 1300s and 1700s is the most dynamic period of the uh, uh, deccan plateau region where most of the urbanizations or most of the historic cities that you see today got developed during that particular period and these um, water systems made it possible especially for these six cities to develop uh, or urbanize as such so these are uh, the historic kanath systems that we find uh, the six cities and the number of systems that we have right so uh, bidar uh, is the first city where these systems were developed and we have three uh, systems uh, uh, kanath systems there the highest number one will find is in ahmednagar 15 right uh, uh, and uh, interestingly uh, they uh, are not uh, similar uh, or in similar in nature when compared to the uh, systems that are there in uh, uh, iran you know especially because of the geology right so here you will find most of these systems are constructed on the plateau region itself and they don't start from a mountain except one of them which starts from uh, a, uh, the alluvial plains of satpura hills right that, that is the burhanpur one rest of them all are uh, part of uh, uh, the plateau deccan plateau itself now so um, i'm just showcasing some of the maps where um, uh, these systems can be seen 
right so this is one of the systems where uh, i am as of now working which is called the nobat kare system and we are in the process of uh, restoration of the system so uh, uh, th there is a lot of activity going on uh, since 2015 in trying to uh, revive the system as such now there are two more systems though so the uh, as uh, uh, as far as i have come across details uh, uh, through uh, historical texts and uh, many uh, available information literature so these were the two systems which were constructed uh, in the early phase of uh, 15th century right when this city uh, bidar you will find this is the uh, old city area and uh, this is the royal enclosure or the fort area right so here they had developed two systems one of these systems starts from within the fort and supplies uh, or starts from the royal fort you can say where all the kings and uh, their uh, army everything stayed and supplied to the uh, metropolis area right so this was completely secure water system so this uh, ran underground no one knew about such a system so uh, th there was no chance of uh, um, uh, what you call even if there is a uh, uh, what you call the someone seizes the from the outside or there is a blockade from the outside by enemy still then they could survive for a longer duration of time because good amount of water was available within the city and you'll find there are city uh, systems which are uh, uh, constructed outside this also does supply water into the city as well so these were uh, surveyed and discovered during the um, 2012 to 2015 period uh, it was a hard task i'll explain to you in so this is again um, bijapur which is one of the most complicated water systems uh, kanath water systems that i have seen in uh, uh, india right so uh, bijapur is as of now called vijayapura right so here you will find this is the citadel which looks like a skull right so the entire uh, the fort area and the main, main citadel right where the king used to live uh, the central part and the original kanath system used to be this the green line that you are seeing and later on it was extended to um, uh, incorporate uh, more water from um, uh, several other systems now here this is the most complicated one because it uses not just the ground water but it also uses lots of surface water bodies so you can see all these surface water bodies which get connected uh, uh, either through pipelines you, ca you cannot even imagine pipelines they were using terracotta pipelines or uh, earthen pipes to uh, bring water to these kind of system and then take it to the city so uh, a huge system as such around uh, 14 to 15 kilometers uh, it runs across uh, the uh, from the outskirts of the city and brings water to the uh, uh, what you call the main city as there is another interesting factor of bijapur though it is not a kanath system but you can say one of the earliest pipeline supply of water uh, that is seen in bijapur so here you'll find from a uh, surface tank they had constructed a uh, pipeline and uh, with the help of tanks or overhead tanks they were carrying it into the city so the overhead tanks were built so that the pressure gets maintained as um, uh, one uh, takes the pipes across um, uh, the city so here uh, uh, the pipelines were put under the uh, ground and uh, uh, people were getting or the citizens within the city were getting uh, uh, water 24 into 7 right several cisterns were there across the city which gets filled up from these pipelines so that was uh, the very interesting aspect now even now many cities in india don't have 24 into 7 water supply and it was uh, you can imagine 15th century 16th century they were able to provide 24 into 7 water supply right so th this is uh, uh, one of the very interesting uh, facts that uh, uh, comes into picture as such <clears throat> now another important factor is the uh, picture that you are seeing alongside so there is a cultural assimilation also that is happening so you'll find urbanization in india does uh, showcase that there is a gap between the urban india which was uh, especially of during this period which was uh, basically uh, uh, by uh, run by muslim rulers and the rural india which was basically hindus right so there was a lot of cultural gap so some of these rulers did try to bring this gap closer so you'll find uh, here uh, the ibrahim adil shah is being showcased as a hermit right and he 
prays or he does uh, uh, pray to the hindu gods that is uh, shiva and brings in ganga from uh, uh, what you call uh, himalayas to bijapur so this is the concept that that uh, the picture or the painting is depicting so this was this kind of cultural assimilation can also be seen uh, in uh, uh, bijapur now coming to ahmednagar this is the place where you have uh, uh, around 15 systems uh, and you can see most of these systems run from the uh, uh, highlands here right uh, as the map showcases and into the city so this center area is the older city and uh, 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 towards where so many canals were this is comparatively drier than other uh, cities uh, uh, which have canal systems and that is why uh, so many systems were dug up some of them were exclusively created uh, for uh, uh, what you call irrigating gardens huge gardens that was maintained by those uh, king uh, uh, dynasties at that time right and uh, uh, the fact about uh, two facts about uh, uh, these cities especially ahmednagar and aurangabad is that uh, both these cities where maximum number of systems were constructed are uh, have used di different techniques lot of open um, uh, trenching system has been done and later on it has been covered up um, uh, after uh, uh, digging the tunnel so these are comparatively shallow when we look at bidar and uh, uh, burhanpur as such right so these systems most of these systems start from or have a support system in the form of um, huge water bodies or dams that were constructed to store runoff water or rainfall water and uh, uh, allow uh, uh, and it allowed it to infiltrate into these uh, uh, systems so you'll find the tunnel systems running right under the uh, water systems or water bodies surface water bodies and you will find water trickling down into these um, uh, galleries kanat galleries and it used to supply water to entire city so as of now i have been able to map two of these systems in uh, aurangabad um, uh, ahmednagar uh, it has been a different a difficult phase because lots of it are uh, already engulfed in the urban uh, jungle so it is very difficult to find the the uh, remnants of these systems so, so to say right but uh, aurangabad one will find that some of these systems these two systems are still partially functional and uh, uh, people still use it uh, when acute scarcity of water happens and in the city because when the city supply uh, fades away during the summer season when the uh, centralized system fails you will find people still depend on these systems to survive um, uh, for uh, port uh, portable water now burhanpur uh, is another city where we have this is the city uh, uh, as i said this is this is something similar to what we have in iran so here it starts from these are satpura mountains which is uh, uh, around uh, uh, 900 meters of elevation as such uh, 700 to 900 meters of elevation so here along the alluvial uh, alluvial fans of uh, the slopes They, they have constructed a, uh, a huge mother well, and from there they uh, they have the uh, the Kanat Gallery or uh, the depth of it is somewhere around 90 feet. So you'll find 90 feet uh, below 90 feet you'll find a tunnel runs into the city, and later on it exits out into the major river system that is there, and it is called the Tapi River. So here there are three mother wells that have been dug. Uh, one is called the kundi bhandara the mool bhandara and the chintaharan bhandara so these three are the source points of um, uh, the water seeping in along these alluvial soil alluvial fans or the slopes of the mountain and then it goes through um, and carries it to the city now here as well you will find pipelined water systems that have been developed right so here you will find a surface water body uh, has been used to bring pipeline into the city as well right similarly uh, a tunnel system also has been dug a, a small stream a small stream of the or tributary of this major river has been dammed uh, and a tunnel has been used or a, a tunnel system has been used to bring water to uh, the city as well so such kind of um, uh, infrastructure uh, was developed during those days so 
the um, uh, the research that I have been doing so i could um, understand that the three uh, three categories in which we can classify the kanat systems in india we can put it into infiltration kanats right where the entire gallery is below the water table right or conveyor kanats where you will find the gallery is above or the tunnel is above the water table but still there is uh, there are sources or it uses a surface water source um, uh, as uh, uh, a source of water and it supplies uh, to, uh, towards the city and there are uh, multi source kanats where you have ground water and surface water both contributing uh, to the kanats um, uh, kanat uh, uh, as a source source of water so um, uh, this especially the one which i explained about bijapur falls in this particular category where there is uh, multiple sources of uh, 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 sources uh, of water as such and uh, the infiltration kanat especially the first one uh, that we saw bidar and uh, the last one that we saw burhanpur fall under this particular category right some of the kanats in uh, aurangabad and ahmednagar fall under this conveyor category as such now these are few photographs uh, to tell you about uh, the character defining elements that we have so normally if you go to iran you will find round vents air vents as such so uh, here you will find variety of different uh, types of air vents that have been constructed so uh, this is uh, the type of air vents that you will find in or the shafts that you will find in ahmednagar and uh, aurangabad where this the size is approximately a meter square right um, um, and the depth is approximately 10 to 15 feet so it this varies as uh, we go towards the higher region right now here the second photograph where you see the red round things are uh, uh, the uh, it is in burhanpur so this is the motherwell area from where you'll find a, a b line of uh, um, uh, air vents so these are again 1 meter in diameter right the, these these are very small and the, here it is the uh, reason for keeping it small and circle is the collapsing uh, geology so it is very soft alluvial soil here uh, because uh, it is along the slopes of uh, the uh, satpura region right and uh, that is why they have kept it like this and in very ingeniously they have constructed they have gone down uh, 90 feet and they are carrying water to the city so bijapur you will find two different um uh, kinds of air vents one which is the uh, air vent for shallow uh, aqueducts or shallow kanats where the water is carried from a surface water body to uh, the main kanat system and the main kanat system have a, a enclosed uh, air vent so some of these uh, uh, things are completely enclosed with a dome so that uh, the dust and the sand does not fall into that and it is open whenever is required for cleaning and in bidar you have uh, there is there is no particular construction as such you'll find it is open it is um, uh, it's the only place where you'll find uh, 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 laterite region has been used for construction of uh, um, uh, kanat systems because the the bedrock is uh, entirely deccan basalt which is an impermeable layer and the uh, highly porous uh, laterite uh, allows water <laughs> you know get, it gets the um uh, becomes the storage house or becomes the good aquifer as such and uh, you'll find a red uh, uh, no uh, stone with uh, which looks something like a beehive uh, no with which stores all this water so you have it, these vents are completely open some of them are really huge you know you you can find 10 meter square uh, huge vents can be seen right and some of them uh, also use uh, huge pipelines to carry a water so here you can see this is bijapur where a 16 meter dia pipe uh, sorry 16 inch dia pipe um, uh, it is all broken uh, and these are small pipes now each segment of pipe is um, uh, just about a feet or so right so these are coupled together and then lime mortar concrete covering is given so lime mortar uh, mixed with uh, local stones etc is covered on that so that it doesn't uh, 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 what you call it doesn't break so imagine uh, what they had done and what people now are doing they are trying to break it right so you'll find lot of uh, things getting destroyed as such now 
here this is the uh, these are bombas or water tower kind of stuffs so here actually the pipeline is running like this in a, a u, inverted u shape so this actually provides uh, uh, the uh, keeps the pressure uh, of the source uh, uh, to carry the water forward uh, into the city area so th these structures have been built to ensure that so the source pressure is kept so the such kind of ingenious things can be seen here only right now these are the kanat galleries this is how the galleries look like inside as uh, so you'll find uh, um, uh, this is ahmednagar so here you can see this is completely brick construction the roof of it so bricks have been used along with lime mortar to cover it so this this is basically an open trenching so after open trenching the the uh, roof has been covered with a, a brick and lime mortar covering similarly it is in aurangabad where you will find the uh, tunnel system uh, has been dug up by open trenching and uh, rock uh, the uh, stone slabs have been used to uh, cover the roof and uh, um, uh, and you will find most of them have that uh, v shape on top or inverted v shape on top right so this uh, again lime mortar has been used to um, uh, cover it up and in burhanpur you will find that they have provided um, uh, stone lining because the geology is uh, uh, crumbling geology is um, uh, alluvial in nature hence uh, they have provided lot of stone lining so that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the there is no collapse inside the tunnel now here this is bijapur again so this is the rock cut section which i said which is the that green line i had showed you so this is the, this is the original kanat as such the initial phase of it this is 90 feet uh, or uh, more than that uh, in certain areas in depth right uh, and this is uh, bidar and uh, uh, bidar we have uh, we have been uh, this is nobad kares where uh, my uh, i am working my research work is going on so we are in the process of restoring it so the uh, up to here you'll find these uh, you can see the marks here right so these uh, the sediments depositions were there debris depositions were there which we cleaned it up and uh, uh, now it has been revived and it is functioning right so this is again burhanpur where you can see lime deposits along the wall which actually is protecting it in a, a manner as such natural protection as such now so this is bidar um, uh, so initial phase when i ended up here uh, so the, uh, most of these vents were in uh, closed conditions some of them were not known so here you can see some of the vents are missing as uh, in the diagram and even uh, here you can see in the um, surface diagram right so uh, these vents are basically 50 meters apart so there should have been more vents as such so uh, investigations did reveal that there were more vents and uh, when we started the cleaning process in 2015 we were able to discover more some of them were uh, opened up and uh, uh, cleaned off all the debris that has been deposited now this is how it looked like in the during the initial survey you'll find lot of waste deposits no some some of the wells were dumped with waste uh, it was very difficult to explore so i was climbing down these vents um, with the help of ropes you know uh, someone helping me from top uh, uh, with the help of laborers going down uh, investigating what is there inside some of the vents look like uh, this with all the tree growth and uh, you know jungle around it and um, collapsing in a state of collapse and there was also surface uh, uh, surface level destruction being caused by anthropogenic activities so here you will find an embankment uh, historic embankment of 11th century uh, getting destroyed for uh, uh, brick making so uh, these kinds of activities were going on when we arrived there and uh, in 2015 we started somewhere around may uh, we started uh, restoration of these uh, karai systems this is one of the tanks uh, to which the Uh, water comes from the uh, uh, system, so this is the channel that carries the water to this particular tank, right? So uh, uh, cleaning was done with the help of uh, uh, expert uh, uh, people, especially I uh, took one of the uh, traditional uh, suranga diggers from um, uh, my state, that is uh, in uh, Kerala, right, uh, where suranga digging is still practiced. and uh, he was uh, able to train the laborers there and uh, help them uh, restore this particular thing so you can see 
the uh, the uh, laborers st staying uh, standing in water this, this was the first time when we discovered water inside that so uh, these are the channels and this is when uh, the uh, rightmost photograph you can say this is when the uh, kare started flowing and you can say i am standing in uh, nearly uh, what you call waist deep waters so you can see one of the vents top uh, top view you can see the uh, water flowing through the channel uh, or the tunnel below the vents now one of the major the challenges that we face uh, today is um, a lack of awareness among people because people don't know that uh, uh, there are uh, you know historic systems that are there right below their feet so you'll find uh, uh, especially if you go to uh, aurangabad uh, ahmed burhanpur uh, even in bidar right you'll find uh, or bijapur you'll find settlements have come up right on top of these uh, water systems and some of their sanitary pits drain into these uh, systems what what happens is the entire groundwater gets polluted so you'll find uh, a lot of coliform bacteria is going to enter into the <laughs> water systems right so uh, urbanization has been a major challenge urban uh, planning has been a major challenge because uh, heritage and uh, heritage related structures you no know, especially what happens is that uh, people consider only huge monuments as heritage they don't look at uh, the, you know these systems uh, uh, which are in existence you know which have been functioning which have been supplying water to the city from historic time periods uh, um, uh, Uh, to be of relevance at all and but the, one thing they are forgetting is that uh, this will lead to uh, entire if they don't uh, protect these systems it will lead to a pollution of entire groundwater body that is there around the city and it will become unconsumable as such right so there is a um, um, lot of um, um, need to look at those issues as such no uh, there are laws there are policies there are uh, heritage zonation related things that are available in master planning etc but appropriate implementation of these are required um, uh, rather than considering an land in urban area as a commodity for sale so uh, you know we need to improve upon it so unless an awareness uh, among people Uh, people won't own these systems or feel pride about these systems so uh, the uh, uh, major conservation challenge is right? there are lots of opportunities when it is restored it will become a local level water security because uh, uh, the centralized water system is always too much pressurized because lots of people to be fed at right? lots of people to be or demand is very high so at least if we are able to provide water to 100 uh, uh, people uh, or 100 households so that much pressure will be reduced from the centralized system so these can act as decentralized water systems within the city right just like just like iran has iran some of these cities have uh, kanak systems providing water uh, to the uh, entire city right so they have banned uh, uh, what you call borewell digging to a certain extent in india it is rampant right there is no uh, particular law as such so you'll find every household goes and digs a, um, a borewell Uh, rather than using these kinds of traditional mechanisms now opportunity is for development of livelihood as well so if these kanaks are restored so you'll find um, uh, there is a, a lot of tourism potential in it people can come visit it also can become um, a, a live water museum where in uh, you know it will become a, a learning point for generations to come right so uh, such kind of uh, initiatives uh, uh, is that we are looking at so thank you uh, for uh, uh, patient listening so this is the uh, nobak kare's uh, mouth where uh, we can see water flowing out of the kare system as such thank you very much thank you thank you for the presentation govind nankati um thank you now we can move on with uh, francisco's presentation if he's ready yes <laughs> Okay. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you for to her to heritage for all for the space. uh good morning good night good evening and good night to anyone 
that is uh, looking at us and the, the other presentations. My intervention is more of a theoretical point of view. Therefore, we are talking about heritage values and how they can be used to a for a guidance of proactive restoration towards to conserve and, and preserve historical buildings and also how this could be a, a, a help for the for its community therefore our first slate is to ask us what is value this uh, this um, term is known for its economical background but also has a philosophical background it's a human resource it's a kind of a language that describes and adopts objects and emotions that surround us. It's also a memory resource, an intangible bond of experience that connects us in, in time and space with objects and other uh, members of our, or of our society. But they tend to be only of a certain moment but they also transform through time and it also transform us and our env environment by the fact that is an, an, uh, by, the, by a necessity that we need to satisfy. That is, we value everything that surrounds us from the most common objects that we have in hand for instance, a, a coffee mug, uh, a photograph, uh, another stuff that makes us who we think we are. Therefore, we have to stand for another question that is why or what values we stand for. This is a kind of a rhetorical question because if we remember most of, of the international charts and the, the uh, most of the, the declarations of um, cultural heritage and world cultural heritage, we always say that we are standing to conserve the, the heritage values. But what heritage values? Therefore, we need to, to, to identify how and what kind of values we have. First, there is this uh, undivisible, undivisible bond that is tangible and intangible values. Tangible are all the, the things that we can be, see, touch, smell, etc. And intangible, are symbolic facts that frame actions and relationships. Like uh, the, when we receive a gift from our grandparents, that is an intangible bond. We only know it and they know it because the, the object is just the, the channel to establish that kind of bond. Both are Indivisi indivisible, as I, I said, because they lay between them, but not uh, all are easy to perceive by several factors. Like hierarchy, that is uh, how we list from top to bottom the things that we see or feel of an object. Uh, like this, this coffee mug. We, when I presented to you, you can um, enlist uh, certain characteristics of it. Some of you might say, I like the color, I don't like the color, uh, I think it serves well for, for its purpose, 
uh, I think I don't like the, the, the function of the of it. It retains well or not the, the heat, the liquid, etc. Therefore, we have polarity. How we can on estimate uh, how they can be as positive or as negative facts that we identify. Not quite as good or bad, because that is another uh, terrain of, of, of moral or ethics and other consider personal considerations. We must more like say that if they can or not uh, provide the satisfaction we need to to achieve our our activities, and there's so in heritage in architectural heritage we also have these two great uh, worlds of of tangible and intangible values. We have the aesthetics, we have technology, technique, space, and function. We all can see and touch and perceive these things because they are part of the image, are part of the, the, the body of the architectural heritage. But in the other hand, there are some kind of values that we cannot see quite immediately, like political values, context values, economic values, and social values. We talk about that in some kind of uh, in, in some kind of uh, moments. All of this connect between themselves because some kind of ornaments are a political statement or of one time or one type of government, etc. We can also talk about the economical values with the technology and the techniques used to build this, this, her this architectural heritage. We know that it's very different when we see a building that, is, that was uh, built with uh, mechanical tools or made by the hand with more, more uh, rust, uh, more, uh, <laughs> or ancient techniques or more ancient tools. But the social value is the most, I think, important part in this uh, intervention because how we approach social values in the architectural heritage, we can understand how the people that use the, the this this heritage sees it, and ha and in that case we can use that information to achieve a more complex and more focused uh, intervention. So therefore, the the idea of a guidance is from the historic review of the buildings we can identify some some values, but for a more concrete overview the specialists need to contrast them with the community. Because la, in that case, more, most of the time, we, the specialists, only happen to be there for a little period of time. We are not commonly part of this community for, for a lifetime. We achieve some kind of time and we move on to another project. Therefore, we need to, to, to sustain our investigation and our, our propositions on the, the, the ways that community sees the, the heritage. And therefore, we need to approach them by three channels. Social media, social media, and direct, direct contact. I, put social media two times because we are now have to talk about not only the social media that is going with, 
within the, the walls of these types of heritage. We also talk about the social media outside the, the walls, inside the world of, of, of the internet. Because now we all, or most of, of the people have access to internet and have uh, a, a, an internet profile have Facebook profiles, Twitter, Instagram, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they are kind, not also uh, a way to express themselves, but to share how and what are things that they make them who they think they are, who they were, what, more, more or less, what makes them them their their interest their heritage their history etc cetera, etc cetera. so we need a direct contact and by these three aspects we need three um, quite as rules but not as rules <laughs> we need to use a colloquial language one of the things that I have seen uh, along the years uh, at, the, the, at, the, at, the, at the master's degree, because this uh, idea of the values are part of my master's degree, stands in first because sometimes the, the themes of culture and heritage are still seen as themes that are only um, well-educated people can talk about. Therefore, we need to use a colloquial language to share the, 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 the community, all of these uh, facts that are there, but not quite simple to see them. And the rule, the second rule is do not underestimate the social medias, the people are not fools. The people are not uh, ignorant. They have knowledge. And the, in this case of heritage, they can have even more knowledge about this heritage or the, or the heritage we are talking or trying to, to work on than us. Because they have lived them. They, 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 work and and have their lives bonded to it for generations and so on and there and there there is a, a another point that it is accept accessibility this stands for the fact that they can feel that they can trust us with this information, with these uh, collaborations, that we are not just going into their uh, heritage only for our economical purposes. No, we are part of a special group that tries to rearrange and re 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 restore these heritage so they can use them for many other uh, generations ahead. Because we understand that heritage is part of their identity, but they also have to happen to be changes in, into the heritage. They have to accept certain changes to fulfill the, the necessities of, of, of the present. We cannot um, change some kind of um, forms and functions of, of the buildings, but we can get into a middle point when we, where, where we can conserve the, the building, but also serve the, the, the necessities of the present. So how to start? Uh, this 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 kind of 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 uh, strategy in poetry kind of 
the first path to to enter poetry is to look the words to establish that words are part of uh, of the windows and the doors that can open or close sometimes the world to us so I think that we need to stand for a new metaphor. Heritage cannot continue to be seen as an old and weak person in need of, of delicate attention. Yes, it needs special attentions, but sometimes this um, way to present heritage to the people can not be as seen as uh, like uh, to have more consideration of it, it can also pr uh, produce other types of, of, of interactions to say like, but if it's too old, why don't we demolish it and build a new one? And that is what we don't want to, to happen. Therefore, I, I propose to start to see heritage as an instant polarity. If you have seen or remember the, the Polaroids, they are an, of a, an instant camera that hands a photographic, a photo that we have to shake it to, in order to, to the, the air can reveal the image. That's how we have to be um, presented. The, the heritage is already there and every one of the members of the community has seen certain values, an economical value, an aesthetic value, a historic value, etc. But if we share all this information in a common language and in other non-academic um, uh, structure, they can enter and see it through the information and reveal to themselves how the how the heritage is more complex than just only uh, a pretty image uh, a landscape or just a fact that had that has to be remembered in school so we can start to see us to to be like the, the the chemist that makes the, the image of the photo pop up. So in that case, I now happen to be kind of this metaphor. I am trying to break through you other forms of how to see heritage and how to start to, to communicate with, with others so your heritage can be seen and can be valued in order to prevail itself for other generations. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, Francisco. Um, Marilia, if you are ready, we can move on with your presentation. You are ready, I'm sure. Yeah. Please. Go back to the start, yeah. So, uh, my name is Marília, I'm a master student at Universidade Federal de Goiás, in Goiânia. And my theme is the Civic Square in Goiânia. And he discovered the historical la layers and its conservative impacts. And my main focus is on the interventions on the space. Probably you never heard about my city, uh, it's a city in the center of Brazil. It's a not a small city. We have uh, one and a half million people living here, but the city is less than 90 years old. So it's very young city, uh, but it's a very big city. The square that I'm talking about here is the Pedro Ludovico Teixeira Square. It's the Civic Square in the city is, and it's the main central axis of Goiânia. Uh, the started point of the city, and it's very different now from the 
first drawing of the, the square. And so the modifications that it, we can see through the years is the main object of my research. Here we have a 3D model that I made for my research. And we have 17 uh, monuments or buildings that are preserved, that are recognized heritage. And we have a lot of others that are not, but they all are in the same place. And I'm studying the changes uh, uh, that have done within its, its construction. And they, most of it are not known or just not recorded uh, on official historic documents. So if you see the history of the square, you are not seeing all of it. You are not seeing the history. You are not seeing the buildings that were destroyed uh, or modified. So I think uh, it's uh, important to understand these various layers uh, that constructed the square that we have today. So uh, I use a lot of graphics on my research. This is one of them, uh, the timeline that I show Goiania, Brasilia, Brazil capital, and the different uh, patrimonial heritage uh, regulations and things that made from the time. So we have a lot of different moments and Goiania is very, <laughs> a new city. And we have a lot of years uh, before the offshore, recognize of its heritage. And the questions I use most is what remains? Uh, why do these alterations be made and for whom? And the ethics thing is a main thing that I use for my work. And it's appeared a lot of uh, research, a lot of on, on my research. I divided the history of the square on five moments, and each one has a similar car, uh, similar things that occur, occur. The first one is the civic square Utopia, because the, this construction and consolidation. Uh, on 33, we had only a plain tech, plain. We had most of nothing here. And it started to build these buildings and it's in the center of Brazil. There's nothing, there's no water, no, uh, no uh, roads, nothing. But they started a big city over here. And it's, uh, for me, it's an intentional monument, the civic square, as Rego says, because uh, for the beginning, it was made for be uh, preserved, be preserved. So uh, each modification that it had on, on time, I think they are modifications on heritage. So that's some of the first photos of the places, the first pictures, there's nothing on the side. So it's a very utopic place. But in 42, we already had a city. And for that on, I consider the, the second moment uh, a small city and a capital city. When it was on 42, the capital of the state of Goiás, but it was a simple life, a simple small town square. We have people walking, bikes, all the small city life running. But the city was growing fast and we had Brasilia on 60s. So Goiânia is very near 200 kilometers from Brasilia and it, it influenced a lot of the city. We have a lot of cars, a lot of people going, 
and uh, we can see uh, the city has grown so fast and uh, the vert verticalization, the urbanism, uh, the modern was influencing the city. And we have a lot of tall buildings, a city that was one, two, three floors. Now we have 13, 20. And so it has changed a lot of the city. And the square is one of the things that you can see that change. You can see the pictures of this, this era. And these things you can see here, uh, the buildings were growing without any registration. We have no planning of these. So if you go to the, the public uh, the places, the museums, you're not seeing these buildings registered. So you, you can, you're not finding, even pictures are hard to find. This is uh, the 70s. We have one of the biggest modifications for me, interventions, was these. We had uh, this bandstand was original from 42, and they demolished part of it and transformed into this modern construction. And it was very polemic at the time. Then they redid that. So they demolished that, the second one and reconstruct the first one. Fatty. And the fourth moment is the 79 to 2000, acquiring the metropolis. The changes on this time are mostly from the cars. The square was a parking line, <laughs> just cars all over the place. They rebuilt the, the bandstand. And you can see all the city, uh, the buildings, and the city, uh, the, the square is very important also for the public uh, manifestations. This is the 84. And the, to, from 2002 day to uh, actual days, we have a wake for the history. We have started to look for this space with more tensions. And for the thir uh, 2003, that we have the first preservation, national preservation from the space. And we have started to change some things. This is one of them. The, this building has suffered uh, a fire and it was uh, rebuilt, some part of it. And the square was like this in 2003. And you can see the parking on the center and the monuments look here. You almost don't see it. So in 2000, uh, they did a, a public contest for the, the revirement of it. And it didn't mean <laughs> nothing because it wasn't uh, actually constructed. So in 2013, we had these, the monuments were cracking and almost uh, wasn't a good place to go on the city. And they did in 2015, the remodelation. And this one actually did happen, but it didn't consider any of the things that Francisco was saying and just consider uh, publicity. And many people uh, here is against one, most of the things that were made. This is the square today. You can see there are no cars inside it, but we can see a lot of buildings that we don't have any, any registration of them. And we still have a lot of things going on. 
uh, a lot of re renovations. Uh, but for now, I really think they still have to listen more to the people, to do these things and to register more. Uh, it's, it's still missing the people on these things. This is the bandstand. Uh, I can show you. It always has been building and rebuilding and rebuilding. In, in, 15, in 2015, it was okay, new. In 2018, it was almost street art, the painting was falling. And it was rebuilt this year and 2020. And this is a picture from last week. And it already has some art and some painting falling apart. And uh, the, the government wants to do the, the uh, cultural circuit on the uh, square, but I can't see any of it uh, falling, uh, working on in real life. It's more publicity, more uh, a thing to put on the papers and the journals, but the things are not happening and they are not listening to the people the, the people and it's a re, it's a real thing they need to know need, need to do to the future and this is it it's a big small part of the, my research and i think it's that Thank you, Marielia, for the presentation. And um, I think we have a, a couple of questions. I will present them to you now. Um, the first question is uh, to Francisco. Um, it is said that since, you, since your suggestion, do you think that is important to link it with pedagogical constituents? Can, can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, since your suggestion, uh, do you think that is important to link it with ped pedagogical constituents? Yes. Uh, this is kind of a, a certain opportunity to reestablish kind of non, uh, a, a non-structural education at the at the textbooks but in in interaction with the real the, with, the, with the real buildings we can see that history happened because the buildings are part of of the that testimony of, of history it's kind of a part of, of complex because like in mexico we always talk about like uh, the independence war and it all occurred in several parts of the country the country is too extensive that if you're studying it, studying it in like in yucatan to move and see how, where the, the independence start is more complex but they're also part of these moments of history that happened uh, in our context. Therefore, it is not just to know the, the, the general story of, of the country, but also how happened, how this history happened in the places we live in. I, I think that this, that, the, that could be more kind of part of, of, of the, of the school's programs, but it's, uh, it, it, it needs more, more, uh, more contribution and more interdisciplinary bonds. Okay, um, thank you for answering. And I'd, I think there is no other questions, so 
Um, I want to thank you all for, uh, for joining us for your presentations. And um, maybe if, uh, if another person has a question, they can email you. And uh, I also invite you, the attendants, to fill in the application of program Exchange Your Heritage in order to create other webinars in the future. And um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. I think we can leave, right? Yes, you can leave. I was <laughs> writing to you. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, thank you.